Hi, I'm Megan Fleming, and today I am going to be reviewing Linda Hogan's novel, Power. Uh, the title speaks for itself with this novel. I truly think it's powerful in its own regard in that it evokes a certain power over its readers. I felt for myself that I was in a trance while reading it. I didn't want it to end. I didn't want to stop. I was anticipating and looking forward to the next idea that Linda Hogan had to share with us. Uh, I think it takes a certain skill uh, for an author to write with such elegance and grace. And Linda Hogan certainly designed a piece of art with this novel and it is a privilege to get an insight into her mind and how she sees the world. And yes, yeah, so I feel a little undeserving reviewing it as I don't know if I can encapsulate its greatness um, and its entirety, but I'm going to try. I'm going to share with you why I think it's great and what I think that she has said to me personally. And um, like I said, it is my, what I'm about to share is my interpretation of this novel. I don't know if it's right. I don't know if it's wrong. I don't know if it's what Linda Hogan expected or intended to, you know, be interpreted, but we'll take it with a grain of salt. You might think by the end of this that, eh, you might think that I'm making a stretch or you might gain a new perspective on the novel. So let's show you and so this is a little uh graphic i made and so yeah so we're gonna dive into linda hogan's power and so the main character the narrator is omish Cho. she's a 16 year old girl uh growing up in florida and she feels as though she is caught in this in-between state between two communities that she uh, has ties to. First, you have the ancient world of the Taiga tribe, and um, within that is her Aunt Ama, who has a great influence on her. Sorry, my tea messed up right there. But um, Aunt Ama has a great influence on her and brings Amish to almost romanticize the way of uh, Native life and their perspective on nature, uh, their outlook on, you know, even just the breath of life through the wind and uh, their ancestry, uh, the Taiga tribe acknowledges the panther as an ancestor of theirs, kind of like, uh, I mean, if you're going to relate it to God, to um, the biblical understanding of Adam and Eve, uh, that is what the Taiga tribe acknowledge with the panther. And so Amishto really respects their perspective on the world around them. And meanwhile, she has her biological ties to the modern world through her family through her mother and stepfather and sister but she tends to kind of dismiss uh the way of the modern world and she feels as though she's an outsider in her own family and i want to say i think it's interesting that she refers to her mother as mama and the name ama is so similar so it's kind of like Misho sees Ama in this motherly figure, and so she's definitely drawn or stuck between these two realms and does not know to which she belongs. Um, so within my mind as I was reading this was the concept of the duality of man, and that's a long thought of concept that is essentially claiming every person has a good side and an evil side. And so I tried to connect this duality to Mishto, who's stuck between these two cultures. And I'm not saying one culture is right, one's wrong, uh, but rather she feels as though she's two separate people, not good or bad, but two separate people within these two worlds. And so with regards to the plot. So one time while Amisho is visiting Ama um, within the tribal boundaries, a hurricane comes and wrecks the entire community and just devastates all the life around them. And then afterwards, Ama sets out on a mission uh, with Amisho kind of blindly following. She doesn't know what Ama's intentions are, or at least um, she doesn't fully recognize it yet. Um, so Alma sets out on a mission to kill the sacred animal, the panther, 
um, an ancestor to the tribe. And although Amisho, when she discovers of Ama's intentions, rejects this idea, she doesn't think that Ama should do this. Uh, only or Ama follows through, and she must pay the price for her illegal act. I mean. It is an endangered species in terms of the modern world, but um, it's also disrespectful and and just inappropriate for her in the tribal sense. And so after Ama has her consequences, Omishto is left to question the two worlds in which she lives and wonder which one she belongs in. So this is where I'll get to. So there's this concept of duality and that maybe similar to man having a good and evil side, everything has two sides to it. And so what I found is that Omishto is taking us through these multiple worlds and I kind of compacted it to the world of life, which is nature versus man, the world of time, which is past versus present, present and the world of truth, which is fact versus faith. And I want to now kind of stray away from the term duality. Um, and I know it's easy because they seem like opposing pairs. And, you know, I, I could just say like nature and man are the duality of life, but I want to switch that. And because after I completed the novel, I reevaluated the topic at hand and, you know, Omisho is such a complex character and a complex situation. And so it seems to me that this idea of a duality is too restrictive. It's like black and white law that, you know, Omisho does, can't wrap her mind around. It doesn't provide any gray area for us. So I think that Omisho and any, every individual and everything in life must be more dimensional than this idea that's equivalent to a two-face coin. I don't think we can merely be heads or tails, this or that. So instead, through her exploration, explorations of the world around her, Amishto illustrates that the spirit of the individual is immense. And it's an assortment of colors. It's not just black or white or gray. It's blue and green and red. And so I've come to the conclusion that the individual is a labyrinth and it's intricately connecting all of the world around us and the worlds beyond us. And I think that through the connection with nature and through her connection with, uh, you know, her belief system and through heritage, all of life holds this power of complexity. Does that make sense? I might be confusing you and I'm sorry if I am, but we're going to try to explain this. So here we have um, Omisha experiencing some internal conflict. Obviously, she's trying to discover herself and discover where she belongs and her place in the world, as we all are. But, um, you know, it's very, it, it's a privilege to be able to go through this path with her. And so she's trying to find her self identity and she can't seem to get through these differing perspectives, or rather, these, you know, Conf these seemingly conflicting um, states of being. So I've determined that nature, well, we'll start off with the, the idea of life, nature and man. So nature like ourselves is neither one thing or the other. Um, it encompasses various dimensions that explode with color and capability beyond measure. And so adapting the ideals of the Taiga people, Omishto acknowledges the strength of the natural world. Um, you can see it through its ability to breathe, to speak, create, and destroy. For example, through the wind, man is given the breath of life, and through a storm, nature has the power to bring something to an end and birth a new beginning. However, in the novel, it's shown that man also has an influence on the natural world. Um, this idea is exemplified through colonization and urbanization, certainly uh, with the, you know, boundaries between life or communities and uh, man taking over territory, taking over nature. Um, but I think a more powerful symbol of, you know, this connection is the songs of native tribes, 
Um, so many people and tribes over the world believe that the strength of this, these songs can change the weather. And that's shown through, you know, the four women that um, or Amishto sees singing right before the storm. And um, they truly believe this so deeply that to not believe this is to be uh, arrogant or uh, ignorant. And so I think my perception of this is that this belief doesn't necessarily claim that we have dominion over the natural world, we as man, but we have a partnership with it. Um, it's not though we can control the world around us, but rather we have the power to work with it. Um, and so in this sense, man is fastened to nature, whether you believe we are created from dust or a panther descending from a hole in the sky. Uh, in this story, Ama is the embodiment of this interdependence. Uh, Amishto states in the beginning of the novel that nature is part of her story. And you can see that through, you know, everything around her, Ama understands the land and the water and the wildlife, and she hears it and feels it through the wind that touches all living things and the wind that gives her life. Uh, Ama so beautifully depicts this connection, yet it's applicable to everyone. Um, nature is part of all of our stories and humans too are part of the history of the natural world. And so this is where the line between man and nature kind of is blurred. Um, I don't think there has to be a distinction. Um, I think that nature and man work together and I believe that uh, uh, Amishto, in a way, is understanding this um, through Ama and their bond. So nature certainly permeates through all of time. Um, you can see by the way that Amishto describes Fossil ro Road that the ground acts as a casket for the bones of the dead of the past. Um, the forest tells stories of the past, like the tree planted by the Spanish colonizers. The first white men walk the same swamps that Amma knows today, uh, with a little change due to weather and time, but it connects all of human life, past and present. And in the courtroom, Omishto recognizes um, how perpetual the past is. And she says, the past is distinct here. It has left traces everywhere. It's beneath us, a shadow with the unwatched beginnings of life. So, Omishto is sharing with us this understanding that time doesn't refer to the past or the present, but time is a correlation of the two. Without the history of the past, there would be no heritage in the present that influence us and our cultures around us. It is a relationship between who we are and who we once were. So time is not restricted to whether it's past or present. It is connected and the past infiltrates the present um, just as much as the present can influence our perception of the past. So this connection of past and present bears all the things we know and we believe to be true. Uh, you can know it by Amisha explaining that she thinks she learned all the wrong things in school. You know, she learns science and math, which, you know, and that, that was uh, discoveries of the past, but she wants to understand more of the world around her in the present time with influence of the past, if, if that makes sense. These ideas are just running through my head. So she's trying to understand time in itself. And as she's trying to understand time and life, she's trying to find the truth of it all. Um, so truth is seen subjectively and objectively. Um, especially in reference to fact and faith. But Amishta questions her perception of truth, and she insists that the human eyes are deceiving, that they're always seeing what's not there as real as if it was. So she undergoes this conflict of faith and fact. She doesn't know what to believe. Um, she can't seem to find stability in the beliefs of others. She shifts in reference to the god of Christianity and the gods of the Taiga tribe. Uh, she, I feel as though she acknowledges that there's a higher being or thinks in some sense there's something greater out there than herself, but it's almost as if she needs to see it to believe it. But we wonder, how is that possible when she doesn't even trust her own eyes, you know? 
So Misho is a tough nut to crack. Um, however, it's clear that she believes in the ways of the Taiga people, or at least she longs and strives to believe it. You can see that when she's giving her testimony in the courtroom, um, she kind of, she feels as though she betrays Ama when saying that she doesn't believe the same things that Ama does. But then in her mind, internally, she retracts that statement and she's, finds kind of this revelation where she's like, but you know what, I do believe it or I want to believe it. So the lines between faith and fact begin to blur as one discovers truth and tradition in a new light. Um, she's, you know, through everything happening through the situation she's in, she's seeing things in a different perspective. And, um, at the end of the novel, when Amisho sees Ama as the Golden Panther, uh, she finally is able to see and feel what she believes. And so I do think that fact can be present within faith, um, whether you believe in the power of tribal songs influencing weather, or you believe in the power of Christian prayer um, to heal and, um, you know, the awkward scene <laughs> where Amisho finds redemption um, in the Christian church. So you can sense and understand faith through the life around you, through nature and culture. And certainly there is not so strong of a divide between fact and faith as we presume there is, or as Omishto comes to recognize. So you might be slightly confused. I just went through a lot with you but here's kind of the sum up is that it's not a divide as you could see here with these lines it is more of a connection between man and nature that makes life i'm past and present that makes time in fact and true in fact and faith that makes truth so i know i mentioned previously that life and time and truth are all these different worlds and you see them here they're in different bubbles um but I, I've tried to slightly make them appear cyclical, um, that, you know, time is involved in nature and in truth and, you know, vice versa. Um, nature has time and truth of its own. And so in reference to worlds and dualities and everything like that, um, I don't think necessarily that they're too different, but I want to present to you these possibilities in reference to this idea of these different worlds. Um, maybe the worlds are separate. Uh, maybe they're so complete and elaborate that one cannot explain all these theories and mysteries. I'm trying, but you know, I, just thinking about all this stuff makes me feel like they have to be separate. They're, they're too complex of ideas. And surely they can touch as we see here, they can influence each other, but it's easier for us to say that they're within these separate dominions. And so uh, there could be other worlds that are beyond our comprehension, like an invisible force field right in front of our faces. Um, as Ama says, there are other worlds beside us all the time and every now and then we cross over and enter one. And every so often, too, one passes over and enter ours. So the fact that another world could just be outside my window um, leads me to believe that we're more connected than we are, or rather these worlds are more connected than they are distinct from each other. So here's my other possibility is that maybe all things are one great big giant world it's a universe maybe it's omnipresent and expansive and it's so much it's so immense that we feel as though we have to create divisions in order to understand it that our, you know our human intelligence can't encapsulate it amish show as she navigates through her understanding of the world or worlds around her appears to think this way appears to have to find a distinction between modern life and tribal life or in the ancient world and the modern world um, and man nature all of those concepts she seems to put a divide there um, however when you're going through this novel with her 
you or rather readers can't acknowledge where the line blurs, where things are correlated and they interconnect. And so I've given you these two possibilities that, you know, everything is just separated like we see here and, you know, it can be spaced out. This can, fact and faith can be far away from nature and truth as you want it. The ancient world and the modern world can be you know, even further, um, even though in this novel, they're represented as just a simple boundary that Ama lives close to. Um, so you could see them as these separate worlds. And I, it's hard to envision it as, you know, one with no boundaries. So there are these two possibilities. Uh, there are many worlds or there's one world. And so I kind of want to say, I hope you're not going to be mad at me for this, that this novel encompasses both. And at the end, you see that when Linda Hogan says that there is a universe of worlds. That, that phrase right there just made me um, mind boggled for a second. So indeed, power is a universe of worlds and this narrative propels us its readers into a new understanding of reality one in which we can recognize the multifaceted complexity of all life um, everything is codependent and cooperative so i think that it's more like sorry it's more like this here um we have every everything that i've addressed here and we have all these other worlds um, existing within this one world. I put little infinity signs or attempted to put little infinity signs to show um, that this can go on. And you, it's kind of like um, mitosis where one spell, cell splits into two, you know, it, it can continue on as life goes. But um, I think that we are in a universe of worlds and that Linda Hogan shows us this. Um, we exist in an expansion of life, time, and truth, and it's constant expansion. I think that the only divides that exist are the ones we as humans create. Something is not this or that. Um, something is not heads or tails. It, it can be both, you know. Omisho can exist within this ancient world and this modern world. She can have both of those identities. Um, Something is not nothing, but something can be anything and everything. Basically, um, I'm trying to say that there are shades of gray and there's the shades of red and blue and green, and it's cycling all around us and within us. And it's okay to exist in this in-between state um, because we're all interconnected. So you can call this a coming of age story or a cultural narrative or whatever other interpretation you have of this message. Um, but I think all of those conclusions will guide you to the recognition that power is evicting and enlightening. And with each page, you're met with reflection and revelation. Hogan beautifully shares with us this tale of tribalism that's equipped with both tragedy and determination. Um, and for me, a person within the modern world of whiteness and suburbia powers a novel that is essential for one who longs and seeks to understand and appreciate the diversity of life. Um, it compels us and it compelled me to recognize that our own worlds exist within the realm of other worlds. And it's, it's, a, it's an expansive concept for sure. Um, it's hard for me to explain it as I'm not, truly researched enough in all of it, but this is, you know, my understanding of what this novel is trying to tell me in particular, that, um, like I said, the only divides that exist are the ones that man create, that truly we are codependent and interconnected. And, you know, my story may not be your story, but we are doubtless all within this labyrinthian universe we're all interconnected. And I think that is just a cool, the coolest idea. So, you know, Amishto feels as though she exists in this in-between. However, these two worlds exist in one universe. She is still a part of something so grand and so big, although she has trouble um, 
getting a tie on her cultural identity. Uh, it's okay to exist in this shade of gray. Um, the world isn't black or white. It's not man versus nature. It's man and nature. And it's not the time or the present or the past or the present. It's both. It's time. It's history. It's heritage. Um, it's not fact or faith. It is fact and faith to make your truth um, and your understanding of your identity and your significance in the world around you. So I hope I didn't confuse you too much. I hope I shared with you a new understanding of um, Linda Hogan's power. It truly captured my heart and shook me a little bit to make me understand, like I said, this new reality. Um, it's kind of like the concept of, it's called Sonder, and it's the idea that um, each passerby -er, everyone you see on the street, in the store, their life is as complex as your own. And we all hold this complexity within us. Um, we all acknowledge these, all these seemingly conflicting parts about us, you know, good or evil, if you want to refer to duality. But however, it's, it's not as conflicting as we make it to be. It is interdependent, for sure. Um, as is all life, as is truth, as is time, as is Omishto, all the parts of her um, make her who she is, whether um, she wants to reject the modern world or whether she can't believe the um, beliefs of the Taiga tribe. All of that, all of this internal confliction, I, I wish I could tell Omishto, I wish she was real, I wish, maybe she is real, but I wish I could tell her that it's okay to be in this in-between because you're still in this universe. You're still connected to everything. Um, and with that said, I guess I will stop confusing you now. And, you know, if you have any thoughts to share with me, I'd love to hear them. Obviously, it's, it's in my head and I'm trying to put it out there. But... I think it's a lot easier for Linda Hogan to share her ideas than it is for me, but we're trying. This novel was fantastic. I am so surprised that she was able to, you know, make all of these like themes and these ideas and these um, just groundbreaking concepts into a mere 250 pages. Um, her novel deserves all the respect. It deserves all the hype. She's a fantastic author, and it was a privilege to be able to read this and analyze it further. And definitely makes me question, you know, um, my own identity and what internal conflict exists within me and how I can find the balance between them or find comfort with balancing them. Um, it's just, it's just an idea. Um, I want to leave with the idea or the concept that we're all interconnected. And if I took away anything from this novel, it is that, you know, I'm not you and I'm not a Misho and I don't understand what she's going through. But in some way, you know, I understand that all life is complex and intricate and that it's okay to not to not know. Like I'm I'm still trying to think of this whole presentation, um, what I've just analyzed and like, do I really know what I know? But it's okay to not know and it's it's okay to feel as though you do know. Um, anyways. But before I confuse you more, uh, thank you for watching. And I hope that in some way I've helped you to see our world in a different light too.